Welcome back to Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. Hey, I want to switch gears just a little bit in this one. Typically, when I do one of these videos, you know, I'm focused on an artist who has specific contributions to a society. So, for example, I might look at a, a Baroque artist who made a certain type of painting that would go on to influence other artists in various styles over time. Sometimes we can pinpoint it down to that individual, and quite frankly, sometimes we can't. In this video, I'm going to be looking at the beginning of art all the way through the bronze. We're going to look at the beginning societies, those beginning cultures, and their influences and impacts that uh, would shape the, uh, the communication of visual art all the way through the Bronze Age. In order to gain some leverage of power, early humans... <laughs> ...or hominids began fashioning rude sorts of tools. They used these various tools to remember their past, to relate to the present, as well as to imagine the future. Depictions of animals and people, largely females, would set them apart from all other animals. This and their special skill of imagination and creativity. You think this is creative? When I was five, I imagined that there was such a thing as a unicorn. And this is before I had even heard of one or seen one. I just drew a picture of a horse that could fly over rainbows and had a huge spike in its head. I was five, five years old. Couldn't even talk yet. Most of this creative innovation was happening about two million years ago. Going back only a million years, again in the continent of Africa, but more recently in Asia and Europe, the innovation of early cutting tools like knives were being developed. Why is this relevant to art? Well, early people are developing a relationship of form to function. They're trying to see something as a form or an object or a shape that is enjoyable in and of itself rather than something that is completely utilitarian. These are the first steps toward art history. In a historical context, a lot of times this Paleolithic time period is known as the Stone Age. It is known as the Stone Age primarily because the only artifacts that remain are those that were created or carved or sculpted out of stone. All of that other type of material has disintegrated or rotted away. The southern edge of Europe was experiencing the last ice sheets slowly melting northward and hunter-gatherers were following animal herds that direction, obviously for food. These people would carve and paint images of these animals on cave walls deep in the earth. There are some rather sophisticated examples of this Paleolithic cave painting art that have been discovered in points all around the world. Current scientific dating has put these images as being developed roughly 40,000 years ago. This would be approximately the end of the last ice age. Many scholars believe that the cave acted as a conduit between the living world and the spirit world. Now there is a bit of a magical meaning behind these caves and their paintings. Only shaman or religious leaders were able to enter the caves and create art. The creation of an image was a very powerful tool reserved for only the most powerful of individuals. Because females obtained the power of recreation, it was probably the case that this power would be reserved for them. Focusing in on the Lascaux cave in France, the drawings of the animals inside of this cave give us evidence of the skill as well as the intelligence and sensitivity that these people would have had to the animals and the artwork that they were creating. Within this cave we see examples of painted animals as well as sculpted animals. 
the animals are really kind of haphazardly arranged around the cave and some overlap and and it doesn't really make sense it's almost like graffiti inside of this thing we can see a prime example of that in the Hall of Bulls which contains 36 depictions of bulls deer and horses there is very little space separating each animal however the time between the creation of the animals could have been a day or it could have been a century we really don't have any idea because these people would have returned time and time again year after year for centuries to create these works on their hunting grounds a major question is what do these paintings mean to the people that made them obviously we can analyze the pictures themselves however I think it's best to look at some other pieces of evidence like simply looking at the location these paintings are hidden away inside of damp and cramped, otherwise unaccessible locations. This is not a location that is conducive to strolling around or congregating as a group, so it is unlikely that this is intended as some sort of an art gallery or place of worship. Through analysis of the cave walls, we know that arrow points and spear tips were thrown at the wall. This is likely due to some sort of belief system where their art provided them good luck in the hunting of these animals. There's no one-stop shop, super Walmart type place at this time, obviously. So the animals were a primary source of what they needed for survival. Every ounce was necessary, and so the animals themselves became revered because it helped them sustain life. Nice! As mentioned previously, three quarters of the paintings done inside of these caves were done by females. Because of their being revered for the ability to reproduce life. These early people understood that the survival of the society hinged on the next generation's ability to be more intelligent and more powerful than the last generation. I am sorry. Loads are sorry too. Look, he sent over uh, a basket with eggs and some fat back bacon. And look, something he whittled. The carvings like the Venus of Willendorf give us a prime example of this idea. This sculpture was found in northern Austria and exemplifies prehistoric beauty. It's not about a pretty face or an idealized body like we would view today, but to these prehistoric people, she was ideal. She basically has no arms and pointy little legs, but there is an exaggerated emphasis on her hips, breasts, that implies significant purpose to her creation. This idealized figurine would have served as a fertility charm for women that sought a deeper connection with childbearing. The idea of the fertility figure continues to this day. For example, the Akan people from Ghana use the aqua ba or fertility doll. Women who wish to have children carry the aqua ba to help them with fertility. This is a practice that began long, long ago with the legend of aqua. Aqua could not have children and so a wooden doll was created. People made fun of her for carrying around this little wooden doll. Leave me alone! But eventually the gods blessed her with a healthy living child. It's almost like Pinocchio. I'm not a puppet. I'm a real boy. We believe that the Venus of Willendorf was of importance to the hunter-gathering society from about 20,000 to 24,000 years ago. Research shows that our brains are genetically programmed to select and be drawn towards specific anatomical points and ignore other parts of the human body. Every human is biologically programmed with the natural pull toward the breast and the stomach, which are the most exaggerated points of this Venus figure. At this point, I'd like to move forward with the Neolithic time period. It's either that or some primal scream therapy. I think it would be best to move on to the Neolithic time period. The Paleolithic time is oftentimes also known as the Old Stone Age, where Neolithic is known as the New Stone Age. The first evidence of the New Stone Age starts to arise in the area now known as Iraq between 9,000 and 6,000 before our common era. The major shift that took place in that part of the world was an agricultural revolution. The people were transitioning their lifestyles as nomadic hunters into gatherers and herders. This lifestyle shift stabilizes human life in one area and produces early architectural and technological advancements. One of these first innovations was ceramic pottery. Some of the best 
examples of this come from the area of modern-day China. The well-preserved burial urn is decorated with bold interlocking designs in a fantastic abstracted form probably derived from nature. Most Neolithic structures were primitive, however there are some signs of sophistication when we start to look at Stonehenge. Constructed in South Central England, Stonehenge would be built in phases with the entire project taking over a millennium to complete. The first phase consisted of constructing a large ditch and mounds in a circular pattern around the construction site. Then relatively large bluestones were organized around the site. 80 bluestones were brought in from 240 miles away in South Wales. To put that 240 miles into context, Bakersfield, California to Tijuana, Mexico, Omaha, Nebraska to Iowa City, Iowa, Washington, D.C. to Boston, Massachusetts are all right around 240 give or take miles. They were making that trip with massive rocks that weighed over five tons. They walked there and drug them back without the use of the wheel. They only could use trimmed tree trunks that would act as a bearing. I don't want to reinvent the wheel here. Researchers believe that on this site there was a wooden structure that had decomposed and was removed. Later phases of Stonehenge show that the people had traveled down the road about 20 miles and brought back huge stones from this quarry. These largest stones are known as megaliths, or great stones. The largest of these stones weighs about 50 tons. The circular arrangement of these stones is known as a crumlech. A true henge is a circular mound of dirt that surrounds an internal ditch. However, Stonehenge does not have that. It's actually not a true henge. The placement of the mounds and the ditches are actually reversed, but I guess that's somewhat irrelevant. In the actual construction itself, they're not just slabs of stone that are thrown on top of one another. It's much more like a puzzle. There's a pin carved on the top of each one of the vertical pieces of stone. Underneath each vertical piece, there's also a knob carved in. The knobs fit into the pin. Each one of the horizontal pieces isn't actually straight either. They're carved in more of an arc fashion, which helps create a perfect circle. They didn't just do this by accident. This was all very well and meticulously planned. Contrary to popular belief, this was not a creation of extraterrestrials or the Transformers. Originally, researchers believed that this was some sort of a sundial calendar that was to mark the beginning of the summer solstice. However, further research has shown that it's actually to show the end of the winter solstice, the longest night of the year, rather than the longest day of the year. Many archaeologists believe that this orientation is important to some sort of funerary rituals that they would have had. And that about finishes up the Stone Age. What? Over? Did you say over? Nothing is over until we decide it is! Well, you know, friends, I've taught Art Appreciation Art 101, man, over the years, several times at the collegiate level. And one of the things that's very true that I always try to get across to students is trying to understand, getting a basic sense or a basic gist of uh, what's going on in history and the humanity side of it, but also understanding what's going on in the fine art side of it. Not just visual arts, but the holistic uh, fine art side of it. And, and maybe uh, I'm not too big into knowing all of the details and, and various professors, and everybody's going to skin that cat different. But if you have a basic sense and a basic idea of what's going on, in history and in the arts uh, in various time frames usually you know you're gonna have a pretty good sense of what what you need to do uh, in terms of a, a base knowledge and one of the things I always like to do is go into some of those really early societies and civilizations this time once again to raise the intellectual level of our program all right let's see what we can do here cities are the basic prerequisite for a civilization as society began to evolve, the artistic life of the civilization has been most densely populated in their largest cities. 
Now, why did these cities grow? They grow because of three basic factors. One, they have access to food. Number two, they have access to work they can do. And maybe most importantly, the creation of bronze by smelting lead and tin together. In this new Bronze Age, it's possible to make new types of weapons, creating larger empires, and also creating larger cities. The bigger the city, the more potential there is for art creation. We see a huge boom of this in Mesopotamia, in an area known as the Fertile Crescent, which is the land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. There are lots of kingdoms and wealth and other innovations going on in this area, but I want to focus on four of these major kingdoms or groups that start to develop. I want to briefly look at Sumer, Akkad, Babylonia, and Assyria. Sumer was one of the first truly developed societies. This is a region that is referred to in the Bible because of its fertile soil, that was perfect for raising crops, sheep, goats, and other livestock. The importance of agriculture would lead to their development of the wheel and plow. In art, they would produce great examples of marble carving, hammered gold, and other forms of three-dimensional art, including ceramics, as clay was very abundant in the river valley. This would also be the birthplace of cuneiform writing. This is the earliest system of writing in the late 4000s BCE. It was replaced by Aramaic in about 900 BC. Writing was a necessity that farmers needed to use to create records of produce, livestock, and accounts of trade. Eventually, it would be used to write stories and allow societies to write their history, and thus move prehistoric societies into historic ones. Most historians regard written language and bronze smelting as the key differences between prehistoric and historic societies. Mesopotamia's most significant form of architecture was the ziggurat. This terrace or stair-step pyramid stood at the center of the city and would serve both as a religious and governmental center. Although not the earliest example, the ziggurat in Ur is the best preserved example. This temple reflects Sumerian's knowledge of mathematics and follows the idea of the golden ratio very closely. This was developed by the Sumerians, but it would definitely have an impact on the Babylonians and Assyrians, who both also built ziggurats. And thus, this society from Mesopotamia would impact their neighbors in Egypt. Akkad emerges as the region's first empire. The Akkadian king rules over the region just north of Sumer, and would have had Sumer under his authority. Akkad had five rulers over its 142-year period of authority in the region. The last great ruler of the region was Naram Sin. Naram Sin's ability to take over the region was recorded on a stele, or stone tablet, with a low-relief carving on the surface. The stele of Naram Sin, sometimes called the Victory Stele, in this case is one that commemorates Naram Sin leading his troops into enemy territory where he is wearing a horned headdress, carrying his bow with dead enemies at his feet. The pink limestone has carvings that celebrate a victory over the Lullaby people around 2200 BC. This low relief carving technique would be borrowed from the Syrians and advanced by the Akkadians and used by other groups around the region. If one examines the Mesopotamian style of portraiture, the head of an Akkadian ruler portrays an absolute monarch. This is a sophistication that comes with a long tradition of craftsmanship. The elaborate hairstyle and rhythmic patterns show a transfer of ideas to the Akkadians from the Sumerians. In a blend of Sumerian and Akkadian cultures, the Babylonian culture was certainly an advanced one. With an interest in education, Babylon excelled in mathematics, literature, agriculture, science, and art. The artistic style of Babylon was certainly in harmony with the rest of Mesopotamia. After examining some of the portrait works by the Sumerians and Akkadians, looking at the Law Code of Hammurabi gives us a perfect look at the Babylonian style and how they all fit together. At the top of this stone relief, or stele, as we've mentioned, we can see an engraved depiction of Hammurabi praying to Shemesh, the god of the sun and justice. 
who is sitting on his throne, handing a scepter and ring to Hammurabi. The legend says that Hammurabi received the code from Shemesh in his first year of reign. There are 16 columns of text on the front and 28 columns of text on the back side of the stele. This is the foundation for law that would help the Babylonian society create the stability that would allow the culture to prosper especially with a very vast and diverse makeup of people. The Law Code of Hammurabi is the longest surviving text from this time period. Its 282 common laws address a variety of topics. In each one of these societies, we see a style of relief sculpture. This would be mastered by the Assyrians. In about 1500 BC, the Assyrians began to develop an art form that would be practiced until about 612 BC. This art was called polychrome carved stone relief. Basically, it was low relief sculpture where the volume is turned up. One of my favorites is Ashurn Asurfal II killing lions, which depicts the king taking aim at a lion from the back of his chariot. The reason that I like this particular work is its use of overlapped images that suggest a degree of depth. Many times these low relief carvings look a little flat and this one really pops out to me. I want to add in one quick bonus for you and that's a really quick look at the Persians. This is a very nomadic people that would eventually settle in West Africa. They were pretty low key until they decided to conquer the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Jews, the Greeks, and many other subgroups. And this is kind of the beginning of the Persian Empire. Many of us have probably heard of Xerxes and remember him from the movie 300. Yours is a fascinating tribe. And he was eventually defeated by Alexander the Great in 331 BC. Now let's focus on some art. The Persians are most famous for their woven silk and the creation of textiles. That rug really tied the room together, did it not? Many of these would contain really cool images of animals, plants, and traditional storylines. And of course, I still get to keep the rug. But their knowledge and skill in textile design went far beyond carpets and furniture. They also used these textiles for their own clothing. Persian aristocrats had very high standards for their clothing, and their fabric was by far the best in the entire world. Thank you again for checking in on Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger.